As we come now to our study together in the Word of God, I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I want us to begin uh, a very interesting subject that focuses upon head coverings for women in church. As I look around today, I don't see any head coverings, so um, this will be an interesting message, to say the least. So, I want to begin by just reading the section. Um, I don't know when's the last time you heard a sermon on women wearing head coverings or not. I don't think I've ever heard a sermon on it, so true to form, we're answering questions no one's asking this morning. So... Um, but it is in the Word of God, and all Scripture is profitable. And it is, this is profitable for us this day. And God had it put in His Word so that wherever the church meets, in whatever generation, on whatever continent, down to the end of the age, that the church would be addressing in its uh, focus upon the full counsel of God. That this text would be uh, one of those passages that the church would come back to again and again. I want to begin by reading the passage, in verse, beginning in verse 2, 1 Corinthians 11. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and that the man is the head of a woman and God is the head of Christ. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. And indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the, wo the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man nor is man independent of woman. For if the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman. And all things originate from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. Wow, what a section. A few years ago, I was teaching a class on expository preaching at the Master's Seminary, and during the course of that class, there were periodic question and answer sessions and I remember one of the students asking me, what is the most difficult passage in the Bible for you to interpret? I said, that's a good question. I've never been asked that question. What is the most challenging portion of Scripture for me to interpret? And after just a few seconds of careful thought, I said, I suppose the answer might be 1 Corinthians 11. I don't know. Uh, because these verses remain somewhat of an enigma as to what is Paul actually saying in these verses. Who is to say what is the most difficult portion of Scripture to untangle the Gordian knots that are in that text? But I think this passage might be on the short list of what are those most difficult 
passages to work through. Now, the focus here is upon the public gathering of the church in Corinth and what is appropriate in corporate worship. God prescribes how corporate worship should take place. And you've heard me say many times, we're, we're never free to worship God however we want to worship God. Uh, th- there is no freedom to just do whatever we want to do. There are certain parameters, and there are guidelines, and there are commandments, and there are precepts that instruct us in the public gathering of God's people. Certainly there is latitude, much latitude within those parameters, but nevertheless God governs how His people should worship Him. Chapters 11 through 14 in 1 Corinthians are, is all directed towards the public worship of the people of God. This particular section, the role of men and women in public worship. And then later in this very chapter, the Lord's Supper. And then chapters 12 through 14, the focus is upon spiritual gifts. In these particular verses, the focus is upon women in their public worship setting and how they make known their submission to their own husbands as they come to church. Um, The women in Corinth were overstepping their bounds in public worship services. Uh, The women were becoming very boisterous, were becoming even rowdy in their expressions in the public worship service, and they were speaking out, and even publicly challenging uh, the handling of the Word of God by their pastors and spiritual leaders, such that later in chapter 14 in verse 34, Paul in this very book will actually say to the church at Corinth, quote, the women are to keep silent in the churches. And the reason he said that is the women were not being silent in the public gathering of the worship services, and they were overstepping their bounds. Certainly it's proper for a woman to sing in church and to fellowship before and after, and and, and even to say amen. But Beyond that, Paul says, the women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are subject, are to subject themselves, just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. And the word improper is a word that means disgraceful, and that it is disgraceful for the woman to speak in church and to assume a position of leadership or to call into account a man. And that is why Paul will say in his first pastoral epistle to Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, I do not allow a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. And what Paul is saying here is that men are to assume a position of leadership in the church, and that is to be visually seen in the gathering of the church, and that the women are to be in a position of support and following and submission. Still, by way of introduction, let us be clear that regarding the personal worth of a woman the intelligence of a woman, the spirituality and godliness and piety of a woman. There is no distinction between men and women. In fact, many women exceed men in their godliness and in their pursuit of of holiness and in their intellectual abilities as they understand the Word of God. The Bible is crystal clear that in the body of Christ, uh, there are no differences in gender in the kingdom of God. The ground at the foot of the cross is level. It is the same blood of Christ that has saved me and saved the men here today. It is that same blood that has saved every woman who puts her faith in Jesus Christ, such that in the church there are no differences racially, socially, 
or with gender. We are all one in Christ. Galatians 3 verse 28 makes this abundantly clear. Paul writes, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. But you are all one in Christ. Close quote. This underscores the perfect unity in the body of Christ and that there is no hierarchy in the kingdom of God. Uh, all believers are equally saved and equally redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. However, there is the matter of headship and submission regarding function and regarding roles that are fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And the difference, again, is not that of personal worth or value. The difference is one of function, as God has assigned different roles to men and to women that are true not only in the family, but also in the church as well. Now, the problem at the church at Corinth is, or was, that there were women, women who were not assuming their God-assigned role of submission in the church. And there were unique expressions of this resistance and this opposition and this rebellion by the women in the church at Corinth. And as Paul receives word, Paul must now address this. And in the church at Corinth, drawn from the culture of that society, there was a head covering that the woman was to wear in the public gathering of the church. As it was on her head, her body was under that head covering. And it signified that her soul and her life is under her head, who is her husband. And so Paul addresses this particular issue in the church at Corinth. Uh, we will not be able to go through all of these verses. And in uh, at least the next study, we will address more the subject of, was this unique to this church, or is this for every church in every place. Now let's begin in verse 2. And let's begin to wade into these verses and try to understand what Paul is saying and what are its implications for us. Now verse 2 begins with the first main heading I want to call the praise expressed. Uh, Paul begins this section by praising the believers there in the church at Corinth. This is an amazing thing for Paul to do, and it speaks of his pastor's heart and how gracious he is because this church is perhaps the most carnal of all of the churches that he has contact with, and it is this very church that has broken his heart so many times. But he begins in verse 2 by expressing his praise for them. Paul does not come down to their level and respond in like manner. Paul maintains a very high uh, uh, walk in his leadership, and he says, Now I praise you because you remember me in everything. When he says that they remember him in everything, he is not referring to peculiarities about his own personal life. He is referring to his ministry, his ministry of teaching the Word of God. And he goes on to make that clear at the end of verse 2, where he says, holding or hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. That's what you remember about me. You remember my preaching and teaching of the Word of God, and because you hold firmly to these traditions, I praise you for this. Now, these were a people who recognized the authority of apostolic teaching. Now, these were a people who recognized uh, the authority of divine revelation that came from God through the apostles, and Paul praises them for this. Uh, you see the word traditions there, and that may be a, a red flag to you, and, and you may say, well, pastor, I thought that we believe in the Bible only and, and not in tradition, and the answer to that is yes, that is very true. Tradition has no authority with us. 
But the authority that is spoken of here is not a man-made tradition. This is a God-assigned tradition that is passed down orally. Uh, There was an oral tradition in the early churches while the Word of God was being written and while the Word of God was being assembled, the apostles continued to verbally preach the Word of God throughout the first century. And there was a passing down from one church to the next and from one generation to the next until the written New Testament was was completed, oral tradition. And as Paul speaks of this oral tradition here, he says, just as I delivered them to you. Paul received his teaching from God. And Paul saw himself merely as a middleman, as a, a messenger of this truth that was revealed from God to Paul, and Paul had much more to say than merely what is recorded in his 13 epistles. He preached many more sermons. He even addressed other issues. What is necessary for us has been recorded in Scripture and finds its way into canonical books of the New Testament. But Paul commends these early uh, believers in Corinth for holding firmly to these God-assigned traditions that Paul has delivered to them. Uh, Just a cross-reference that is helpful is 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 15, when Paul writes to the Thessalonians, So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, comma, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. See, there are the two categories of tradition. There is that which is written, and that which is passed down merely verbally. And Paul commends them for this. And so they are a people who are under the authority of the Word of God, and Paul commends them for remembering what he had taught. I remember when I first graduated from seminary and I was past my first pastorate, um, uh, I was in a very much a learning curve and and, and was with a church that was very gracious to allow that yearn, learning curve for a young man. But God also brought me there to teach that church much, as it was on a learning curve as well, as we brought about reformation in that church. I remember one of the challenges that I had was the chairman of the elders in that church, who was a charter member of the church and a very noted surgeon in town, a very commanding uh, individual, And he used to say to me periodically, he had a little poem that he would quote, and I can't remember really how that poem would go. But the gist of it was is that that I don't really care to hear a sermon. All I want to do is see a sermon. And there's an element of truth in that, that obviously the preacher should live out what he preaches. But if all you do is remember what the preacher lives and not what he says, then it's a total waste of time to come to church. It's a total waste of time to be in Bible study, a total waste of time to be gathered together in the public setting as the Word of God is preached. Paul would have been very upset with the Corinthians if they had not remembered the traditions of truth that he had passed down to them. And so it is worth commending them. So Paul begins with commendation before he will go to correction. He begins with praise before he will go to the problem. And this is a very good style of teaching. And it's also very good for parents as well. To begin by affirming the positive before addressing the negative that must be addressed. And by way of example, I think of the seven letters to the seven churches that as our Lord addressed those churches, you remember the first one with Ephesus. He just praises them, and there are many things for which to praise that church. And then you come to verse 4, but I have this against you. You have left your first love. That's what Paul is doing here. He begins by affirming them, to endear himself to them. Not in a false manipulative way, but just knowing something of human nature that I have something vitally important to tell you, and it may be hard for you to hear this. And let me begin by uh, affirming you and commending you and saying something that is true. And so that is why Paul begins with this 
praise. Second, not only the praise expressed, but now the problem addressed. That is in verse 3, the problem addressed. And verse 3 begins with the word, but. It's a strong word of contrast. That, that should signal every one of us that what follows is now going to head in a different direction. I praise you, but. And when Paul says, but I want you to understand, clearly they did not understand something. They need to be reminded yet again of what he has already taught them, and they have forgotten them. Uh, but indicates that there is a matter for which he cannot praise them. Uh, the word but would, could be stated to the contrary. Uh, but you have fallen short in a particular matter. He says, but I want you to understand. They had failed to hold firmly to a particular part of the tradition that he had delivered to them. They had failed to remember this. And now he goes on to give what must be the theological foundation and framework. The theological foundation and framework for the church as well as for the family. He states now, note, that Christ is the head of every man, and that the man is the head of a woman, and that God is the head of Christ. There are oceans of theology in those little islands of statements. Um, the key word is the word head, H-E-A-D. Uh, it is mentioned three times in this one verse alone. It's mentioned ten times in the book of 1 Corinthians. It's mentioned 75 times in the New Testament. This is a very important word, and they had, they had forgotten this word, and they had failed to understand this word. Uh, the key word being head. The word head refers to the ruling part of the body. Uh, the head provides direction. Uh, the head, uh, to control the head is to control the whole body. It carries the idea of a ruler. It carries the idea of, of chief. Uh, it signifies authority, uh, one having authority over the body, and that authority is a God-given authority. Now, verse 3 indicates that there is a threefold headship, uh, one, that Christ is the head of every man, uh, whether male or female, Christ is the head of every man, two, uh, the man is the head of a woman, meaning his wife. And then three, God the Father is the head of God the Son. And in each of these, this three-level uh, headship, there is implied the corresponding submission that under the headship of God the Father is the submission of God the Son. And under the headship of Christ should be every man, certainly every believer, and under the headship of every husband should be the submission of his wife. So that is what Paul is laying out. Now I want us to look at each of these three in, in, individually, and, and this is very important theology that, that uh, he will then hang his thoughts on this framework. Uh, let's begin first with the one that he mentions last, which is uh, God is the head of Christ. So, number one, within the Godhead, within the Trinity, there is headship and submission. Uh, God the Father and God the Son have different roles. They have different functions. And in this differentiation of roles and and functions, there is headship and submission. Now, what is important to note is that they are, act, they are absolutely co-equal and co-eternal in their essential person and being. Uh, the Father is not of greater value than the Son. 
Uh, the Father does not possess uh, an omnipotence or an omnipresence or an omniscience that the Son does not possess. They are co-equal and co-eternal in their character, in their attributes, in their, in their being. But within the Godhead, according to the inscrutable wisdom of God the Father, God the Son has been assigned the role of Savior and Redeemer and the agent of God in creation and the agent of God in providence, such that in His incarnation, Jesus Christ, in the will of God, was to leave behind all of the full prerogatives, the, the exercise of the full prerogatives that belong to Him as fully God, and to come into this world via the virgin birth and to clothe himself in the form of a slave. And by so doing, assume in humble obedience the will of God assigned by him. It is not a matter of the Father, again, being of greater value than the Son. They are, their value is equal. They, we are to worship all three equally. We are to be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There are numerous texts to which we can turn in which the Father, the Son, and even the Spirit are considered to be one. Yet in the operation of the will of God and in the carrying out of the plan of God, the salvation of God, there are different positions, if you will, on the one team, the one in the, in the Godhead that each member is to carry out. And all of this is a critically important truth for when we come to the matter of the church, how worship in the church is to function. Let me give you just a couple of verses. Uh, still, under the, uh, the God is the head of Christ. In John 4, verse 34, Jesus said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. John 5, verse 30, I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 6, verse 38, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That meant no diminishment of the deity of Christ to assume this submissive role in the carrying out of the plan of salvation. And it is the very role that God will call upon every one of us to assume. Whether male or female, in the body of Christ, we are all to be submissive to the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for any of us not to be in submission to the headship of Christ, we would say that is rank rebellion and it is a revolt against the, the supreme authority of Jesus Christ. And where he is headed with this, it is the same submission that God requires of every woman in relationship to her husband. And that if she is not in submission to her husband, that too is a matter of rank rebellion and revolt against not just her husband, but against God himself who has established this order. Now, as we look at verse 3, as you see the threefold distinctions there, as God is the head of Christ, so is Christ the head of every man, and so is the man the head of a woman. It's important that you would note the first use of the word man is a different word than the second use for the word man. Uh, the first use of the word man is a word that refers to all mankind, uh, that it refers to uh, all people, whether male or female. It is not a, a gender distinctive term. And so when he says Christ is the head of every man, he's not referring to just the husband. He's referring to the husband and the wife. He's referring to the man and the woman. Uh, it is a Greek word that uh, andros, which means both male and female. And then when he says, and the man is the head of a woman, 
he shifts words, and that should immediately catch our attention, and he uses an entirely different Greek word that means the male. And in this case, and in this context, referring to the husband. So, in this, in this virtual pyramid of, of headship and submission that God has established, Beginning at the highest level, Paul points us to the Trinity. He points us to the Godhead. And he will say that what takes place in the church should look like heaven. That what takes place between uh, a man and a woman in the public gathering of the church, it should not look like the world. It should look like heaven. And in heaven there is this headship of the Father and submission of the Son in just that same manner as you look into the church, there should be a twofold submission. One, there should be the submission of, of every man and every woman under the supreme authority of Christ, under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And there is not a one of us here today who is our own head in the Christian life. Uh, we are all under Him who is head over all. Ephesians 1, verse 22. God put all things under His feet and gave Him His head over all things to the church. And in Colossians 1, 18, he again, Christ again is referred to as the head of the church. But to carry this now down to the third and final level, what Paul is establishing for the church in Corinth and for every church is that the man is the head of a woman. It is true in the family and it is true in the church. In this word, as I've said for man, it refers to the male gender and it refers to the husband of the woman. Now, this is not unique teaching in the Scripture. Let me give you two cross-references just to... Uh, give the broader teaching of the Word of God. In Ephesians 5 and verse 22, we read, Husbands, be sub... Excuse me, husbands. Wives. Wives, be subject to your own husbands. The word own is very important. Wives are not to be subject to every husband. But to your own husbands. The word subject there is a Greek word that means to line up under the authority of. It's a military word, that one who is lower in rank and function will line up under the higher authority of the one who has been placed above him, uh, where that is seen in the military, so that is to be seen in the loving context of the family. Ephesians 5.22, wives be subject to your own husbands, and then Paul adds, as to the Lord. Your submission to your husband is as unto the Lord, meaning you are to do it for the higher motive of the glory of God. Uh, your husband is certainly not perfect. And as you are submissive to him, it is not based upon his, his merit, but it is to be done as unto the Lord because this is the God-ordained order. He then says, for the husband is the head of the wife. And there is that word head again. It's the head that gives direction to the body. Even so, the husband is to give direction to his wife. Uh, a body that does not respond to the head. Let me say that again. A body that does not respond to the head is either crippled, paralyzed, uh, spastic, or dead. Every healthy body will respond to the head. And so he says, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. And the same truth is taught in Colossians 3 and verse 18, Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. So, 
once again, this is the theological foundation and framework for the Godhead, for the church, for believers in their relationship to Christ, and also for the family. Further, this is true in other areas as well that God has ordained as it relates to society as a whole and the role of government and government leaders and the submission of citizens under the authority of those who are placed in positions over them in the government. It is true for the workplace with masters and slaves or employees and employers. It's the principle of headship and submission that God has built into all society and the church. And it is, exhibit, it is exhibited in the Trinity itself. So, that is the second main heading that I want you to see. And anything that does not square with what Paul states in verse 3, it, it is amiss. It will send the wrong signals to people who come into the worship service that there will be a distorted view of God in heaven. Now, number three, the practice corrected. And we'll just begin uh, looking at these verses and pick it up next time. Uh, but the practice corrected now in verses 4 through 6. And so Paul says in verse 4, Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying, prophesying, disgraces his head. To disgrace his head means to bring shame upon the one who is his head, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the head of the husband, the head of the man, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it dishonors Christ and it uh, robs him of his glory that in the public worship service, that any man, whether up front or uh, in a supportive role, would have something on his head while praying or prophesying. Now, there's some question as to what, is, what does this mean, on his head? And there are two schools of thought, and I want you to know this as part of the challenge of working our way through this. Literally, when this reads, has something on his head, and you'll notice the word something is in italics in the New American Standard, meaning it's been added uh, by the translator, and it just literally says, has on his head. It literally means having, hanging down from the head. Having, we would add something, hanging down from the head. Now, there are two possibilities, and we just need to take the time to put these two possibilities out there if we're to understand this. One is in reference to the, uh, the Roman practice of wearing a toga that had a hood, um, and that was used in pagan worship services, that there would, the man would come into the service and he would have a, a toga on, and as he would kneel before uh, uh, an idol... He would pull the hood up over his head as he would bow before the pagan idol. And by pulling the, the, the hood up over his head, he was giving allegiance to this uh, idol as though coming under the headship of this idol, coming under the authority of this idol. And then as... Men were saved by the grace of God and by the gospel of Christ. They would come into the worship service of the true believers and they would bring their cultural practice and they would bring their togas on. And as the service would begin, they would pull their hoods up over their, their heads and uh, cover their heads in that way. And Paul is saying, no, do not be bringing these pagan idolatrous practices into this Christian worship service, leave that out, and it is communicating something, and it is sending a signal of still giving allegiance to these pagan gods. That is one possibility, and that is based upon historical background 
and evidence that is not in the biblical text, and so we are dependent upon uh, early sources to give us that backdrop. There is another possibility, and it is actually found in the text itself, and it is in verse 14. It is possible that this, uh, this which would hang down from the head could be the long hair of the man. And we read in verse 14, this hanging down from the head. Uh, does not even nature itself teach you? When he says nature itself, he's, he's just saying it's in, it, it, it should be instinctive within any clear-thinking person. That for a man to have long hair is, is inappropriate. Um, it, it, it is a, a violation of his masculinity and of his malehood. So he says in verse 14, does not even nature itself teach you that a man, that if a man has long hair, it, it is a dishon dishonor to him. Um, it, it does not represent the God assigned role that God has given to him to be a man. And what this is saying is that God has designed for there to be a distinction between men and women. There is not to be a unisex movement. Men are to look like men, and women are to look like women. Uh, it's been well said that the pastor ought not to have to say when he performs a wedding ceremony, uh, will one of you kiss the bride? Uh, you ought to know who is the man and who is the woman. And, and that's not, you know, redneck uh, theology or whatever. That is just the teaching of the Bible. Uh, it is the teaching of the Word of God according to the cultural norms of the day. So that's where he begins in, in, in verse 4. And which of these two? It is not immediately apparent in, in the text in front of us. What is important is that as a man is in, a, is in the public worship of God and as he gathers, there should not be... A, a head covering on his head. And so that's why also uh, if someone comes in here, you can be dressed shabbily. You don't have to be uh, dressed at a, at a certain standard, but if you come in with a, a hat on your head and it's turned backwards, uh, it is sending a signal of some sort that, that you're marching to the beat of your own drummer, that you're, you're going your own way. It's an anti-establishment statement, and it is a dishonor to have your head covered in a, in a raucous fashion in this culture. Now, in verse 5, but every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. Now, her head, she has two heads. She has the headship of her husband, and she has the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ that are both mentioned in verse 3. And so, as she comes into the public worship service and her head is uncovered, there is a dual shame that she is making a visual statement in the worship service. Now, the word but that begins verse 5, uh, it, again, is a very strong word of contrast. But on the other hand, on the other side of the issue is the woman. Now... Every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. Um, in Corinth, a woman's covered head in worship was a symbol of her subordinate position to her husband. Uh, there was a, 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 a cultural practice in the, the area of Corinth by which the women did have some kind of head covering that communicated that I am under the headship of my husband and I am under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ as I come into this house of worship. Uh, Paul then gives the explanation in the middle of verse 5. He says for, and the word for introduces an, an explanation. Paul now explains the disgrace caused by the woman 
with a head uncovered in worship. For she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. Now, he says it, it is the very same as the woman who comes into church and she has totally buzzed her head. She, she has a, a shaved head. And he said it, it's sending the same signal and the same message. And so there are three possible meanings, and we'll conclude this message on, on these three possible meanings. And there's just a lot to get out on this. I know you women are dying to hear this, all right? So he, here are these three. Uh, number one, some scholars argue that a woman with her head shaved was the practice of pagan idolatry. It was practiced in the pagan worship services, and it's still practiced today in the Far East and in, in many places where priestess says, uh, shave their head. They just buzz their head, and it's a, a sign of their, uh, of their being uh, of a vow to their God, an allegiance to their false God. That's one possibility. Another possibility uh, is that it refers to the prostitute or the adulterous woman. And uh, it was a practice in this day, if a woman was caught in adultery, uh, and the death penalty is no longer in effect, as it was in the Old Testament, uh, that the husband would shave the head of the woman, and it would be her public shame as she comes into a public setting for everyone to know that this woman has been unfaithful to me, and she has not been under the authority of my leadership, or it could refer to one who was a prostitute as well and send that signal. Or third, uh, some scholars state that this refers to a feminist uh, who is rebelling against society as a whole. And she is rebelling against the Word of God. And she is rebelling against God. And she is rebelling against her God assign distinctions between God and men. I mean, we would say today, she has a butch haircut. She, she is wanting to look totally different, and it is a statement of, of, of her rebellion in her heart uh, against God. And in this context, we do see in verse 15 that Paul says that the glory of a woman is her long hair and that her long hair is to be prized uh, to the extent that, that her age and her body genetics allow her to have long hair, uh, that it is a glory to her. And he goes on to say in verse 16 that if one is inclined to be contentious, if one is, is really rebellious at heart, then they will take up some other practice than what God has said here with long hair. So for a woman to just shave her hair off and, and to cut it down is a statement of autonomy. It is a statement of, of, of independence and a statement of not being in submission under God and not being under His authority. So these are the three options of what this means that she would shave her head and none of the three are good, whichever one is the right interpretation. It's either a pagan worshiper who is now saved but who wants to retain some of this pagan uh, worship practice or it is a prostitute or is an adulterous woman or it is a feminist. All of those are bad options. And what Paul says is the woman who comes into the public worship service without her head covering on or without her head covered she is as disgraceful as a feminist, a prostitute, an adulteress, or a pagan worshiper. Now, these are Paul's words. These are not my words. And so it was a very serious thing in the church at Corinth. Well, look at verse 6, and we'll, we'll conclude here at, at verse 6. For if a woman does not cover her head... So there, there is some... Something that she does that covers her head. For if, if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. Meaning, if you're going to come into the worship service and your head is not covered, 
you might as well just have shaved your head. It's sending the same signal. It's sending the, the same message uh, to everyone else. Then he says, but if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. Now what he is saying is, if the woman comes into the service and she has a shaved head and she is sending huge signals to everyone who comes in that I am not under the authority of God and I am not under the authority of my husband and I don't want to be and now she hears the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and if the Son shall set you free you shall be free indeed and she hears of a, of a new liberation which is a true liberation that Jesus Christ will set her free to live life and to live it abundantly and she repents of her insubordination and she repents of her lack of submission and she believes upon Christ and now she submits herself to the Lord Jesus Christ and she comes under His authority. Paul is saying, well, she still has a bald head. Let her put a head covering on her head and let her now give this public statement, though she has a bald head, let her now testify visually in what she has on that she is one who has died to self she has come under the sovereign lordship of Christ, and she now is a true believer in Christ. That seems to be what Paul is saying in these verses. Now, these are the easy ones, and next time we'll advance to the more difficult and challenging ones. And if anything, there should be a great curiosity, if not desire, in each of our hearts to dig to the bottom of what these verses are actually saying. Now, as I bring this message to a close, this is, let, let's just get down to the bottom line. The bottom line for every one of us here today is submission and humility to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, right? Whether you stand on your head in this worship service or, or whether, wh whatever the cultural expressions on anything is, it is the heart that is of fundamental importance. And what is direly important is that each one of us die to self daily. I want to ask you this question. Are you dead to self? Are you alive to the Lord Jesus Christ? This is really the fundamental uh, issue for every one of us here today. It is necessary in order to be saved. It is necessary in order for us to progress in sanctification. And so I would call all of us to examine ourselves and to look within our own souls. Am I truly one whose life is yielded to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Am I truly willing to go anywhere, do anything, pay any price, however God would lead in, in my life? Uh, Am, am, is my life a living and holy sacrifice presented to the Lord? And for every Christian wife here today, are you under the headship of your husband? Uh, do you love him? Do you support him? Uh, do you affirm him? Uh, he is your head, and you are his body, and it is God's design that he lead through your husband. You will have much input. You will have much to contribute. And, and there is victory in a multitude of counselors, even between husband and wife. And yet, ultimately, the leadership rests with the man. And churches are the strongest where there is strong male leadership. Families are the strongest where there, are, where there is strong male leadership. And any home will always be a weak home to the extent that the man does not lead out. And the truth is, many women are almost forced to lead out at home at times because their men are so passive and because the men do not assume their God-assigned role of headship. And so this should call all of us here today 
to step forward and to assume the posture of submission and humility, and for men to assume the position of leadership and headship in the home as well as in the church. May the Lord give us understanding. May the Holy Spirit truly be our teacher, capital T. May He be our primary instructor in these verses. May He enlighten us and illumine us why He would take 15 verses when so much could be discussed to bring this teaching to bear upon our lives. Oh, may God give us insight today and next week as we will continue to look at this important section.